Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, language change. We are into our lecture six, and this is um, part three of uh, this sixth lecture in bilingualism. In this part, uh, we will discuss how do we know languages are related. So this is uh, our main focus of this part, and here we will see. Uh, different uh, methods, different approaches uh, to uh, which are applied, employed to to find out uh, relations, interrelations between languages. Linguists rely on systematic sound changes to establish the relationships between languages. The basic idea is that when a change occurs within a speech community, it gets diffused across the entire community of speakers of the language. So it gets across uh, all, all through the community of the sp uh, community of the speakers of the, uh, that language. If, uh, however, the communities have split uh, and they are no longer in contact, so they are divided, communities have been divided and they are no longer in contact, so that change uh, that happened uh, in one community or the change that happens in one community does not get diffused to the other community because they are not in contact with each other. So the change that occurs in the speech of one community uh, that does not spread uh, in the other part of the community that is, uh, uh, that is uh, in not in contact with that community, the speech community. Words in two or more daughter languages that derive from the same word uh, in the ancestral language are known as cognates. So the words in two or more daughter languages that derive from the same uh, the origin of that word is is the same and in the mother language is the same. So those two words which have the same origin they are uh, known as cognates. Sound changes work to change the actual phonetic form of the word in the different languages, but we can still recognize them as originating from a common source because of the regularities within each language. Here we have example. For example, a change happened in Italian. Was that? A change happened in Italian, uh, like uh, that in initial consonant clusters. The I, uh, sorry, the L that originally followed P and F is changed to I. The originally, L uh, was uh, uh, followed by P and F, but that L changed to I. Uh, so the words, Italian words uh, like fior, uh, that means flower, uh, fiom means river in English, and pioggia, uh, it means rain, and pioma, that means feather. So these four words, actually, uh, in Italian language, they are cognates with the French Filor, filioi, and plui and plume, respectively. I mean, these four words are respectively cognates to these French words, and these four words are also cognates to Spanish. Uh, we have uh, Spanish words also here: flora for fior, and f fluvial uh, for fume, and illuvia. Uh, that's what I think, <laughs> because uh, I, maybe it's double L or I first, but uh, double L doesn't make sense here. Uh, so, illuvia uh, uh, is for P, 
Pioja rain and pluma. So, so these four words are uh, Italian four words are cognates with French uh, four words we saw and the Spanish four words as well. So here, uh, here we have uh, a table uh, down there. You can see uh, we have English words, uh, mother and father, and then we have six uh, Romance languages that are uh, originated from Latin, French, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, Romanian, and Catalan. So, mother in English, in French, is, is uh, called as mar, and Italian, madre, and Spanish, uh, the same, madre, uh, Portuguese, my, uh, Romanian, mama, and Catalan, mare. And father, see here uh, for in French father means pa and Italian padre Spanish padre and Portuguese pai Romanian tata and Catalan pare so in this the word mother in this table uh, uh, the word for mother in all these languages uh, it cognates in all six contemporary languages but the word uh, for father in all these languages so is a cognate only uh, five of the six languages. In Romanian, uh, the original word inherited from Latin pater. So in Latin, the original word is pater for father, but it's replaced by a completely different word, tata, in Romanian. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, a different word. Yeah, I mean, it's not uh, related to uh, its original uh, uh, language, Latin. All right. Further to this, in this table, uh, we see only Spanish and Italian are the uh, two languages that retain a phonological reflex of the original Latin medial uh, consonant T. So you can see in this table, in Spanish and Italian, for mother is madre. Uh, in both Italian and Spanish, and for same as the case with the father, padre, uh, in both Italian and Spanish. In both languages, it has been voiced to D, however, it's not uh, uh, exactly the same, but it is reflecting the sound, original sound of Latin uh, consonant T. Uh, uh, probably a change, uh, this is a pr uh, change that occurred in the common ancestors ancestor to all the dialects and languages of the Iberian Peninsula. All the uh, other Romance languages have dropped it. So this ta sound, if you see in the table, uh, all other languages in French, there is no ta or da sound, and same is the case with Portuguese, Romanian, and Catalan. So all other Romance languages have dropped this uh, uh, T. All right. So the original R has also suffered different fates. In this table, you see the original R that has been uh, in in Latin. Original R has been also dealt differently by all these languages. Or within each language, the same thing happened in both words. But I mean, the same thing happened in both words uh, with the father and mother. Same thing with all the languages. Uh, you see here, R uh, is uh, uh, deleted. We've, uh, we find R deleted in final position in the word for mother. We also find it deleted in the same position in the word for father. You see this um, R, there's no R in Romanian, uh, 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 but uh, the word father is totally different here. But in the case of R, it's dropped. Both, uh, both uh, is dropped in both the cases for, ma for mother and father. Portuguese uh, also is dropped. And uh, what else? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Polynesian family, we have here uh, some words. Uh, 
uh, in uh, English, we have bird, fish, uh, to eat, forbidden, eye, blood, and we have Polynesian family, uh, some languages here, Tongan, Maori, uh, Samoan, Tahitian, and Hawaiian. So the same principles are applied in languages uh, that do not have a written history. Several cognate sets in five languages of the Polynesian family are listed in, in this table above here. Uh, we see that in this table, uh, no changes happen in the nasal consonants nor in the vowels. So here, in nasal consonants, there is no change if you see there. Uh, what are the nasal consonants? I think M and N. So there is no change in all the languages. They are they are retained. And same is the case uh, with vowels. So there is no change in the vowel as well. You see, uh, vowel is retained in all three uh, through this list. Uh, but we can see uh, in uh, line number two and uh, line number three that. Uh, wherever Tongan and Maori have ka sound, ka, uh, Samoan, Tahitian, and Huavian appear to have a glottal stop, question mark, as a glottal stop. So we see here, this is different uh, in line two and three. And apparently, there has been an unconditioned change from to the glottal stop uh, in the eastern branch. So these countries where we have uh, glottal stop, so th uh, these are the eastern part of uh, that region. Uh, or a change from ka to ka in the western branch of this family. So in the western countries, western part of this, so there is ka for ka, so there, this is, there is no change, but in the eastern, so there is a change in this uh, ka sound. It's replaced by the glottal stop. We choose the first as more likely, partly because ta is a more common phoneme in the words languages, uh, partly because backing of consonants is more common than fronting, and partly because of what we know about the culture history. Polynesia was peopled from west to east, and if the change had occurred in the western branch, that would not uh, that would have been at a time when all five languages were still one speech community. Next, we see uh, in this table. If you go back, I mean you can go back, but uh, if uh, I mean, all right. So uh, we see in line four and six. So uh, four is uh, four, two six actually is forbidden. The words are forbidden, eye and blood there. So that there is a systematic correspondence between ta in the first four languages and ka in the eastern most Huavian. So you see in the four forbidden, in Tangan we have tapu, uh, Maori tapu, Samoan tapu, and Tahitian tapu and Hawaiian, not tapu, is kapu, right? And in uh, number five, I, so in Tongan is mata, Maori mata, Samoan mata, Tahitian mata, but Hawaiian is not mata, is maka. And number six, blood. So it's toto, 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 and in Hawaiian is coco. So this looks like another systematic, unconditioned sound change. Uh, this time is uh, is with only uh, with one language, that is Hawaiian. So in Hawaiian, uh, is I mean the k the ta is replaced by ka. 
uh, we can see uh, from this example that uh, that when English borrowed the Polynesian word for forbidden, we borrowed it from one of the languages west of Hawaii. We said taboo, not kabu. We borrowed it from there, but we pronounce it, we say it taboo in English, not uh, kabu. In the examples just discussed, the central enterprise has been to establish a systematic pattern of change. Most often, it's sound change. Every original Malay Polynesian, ta becomes ka in Hawaiian. Uh, this is what we observed. And we can cite many correspondence of cognate pairs to prove it. So there may be many examples, many uh, uh, vocab it items in Hawaiian language to prove this, that all ta uh, are replaced by ka. This level of understanding is useful for uh, several reasons. Let's see. First, a systematic pattern of phonological correspondence across many words is unlikely to have arisen by chance, whereas completely unrelated languages often develop surprising similarities in particular words entirely by chance, not systematic. Second, uh, given systematic patterns of this type, we can start to apply the comparative method to construct the parent language. This in turn allows us to examine relationships among reconstructed languages at a great, uh, greater time depth. Even if the process of change entirely obscures uh, the relationships among the vocabulary items in the child languages. However, establishing patterns of this type is difficult. Uh, it requires a large vocabulary in all the languages being uh, compared in order to find NF cognates. And it also requires a deep knowledge of grammar of each of the languages in order to see cognate relationships that might be obscured by morphology and contextual phonological change. And not to be fooled into seeing false cognates where morphology or phonology have created chance similarities. So here we have, after this, we have another approach, uh, lex uh, lexicostatistics. So this approach was pioneered by uh, the American structuralist linguist Morris Swedish. And uh, uh, this approach is known, of course, uh, lexostatistics. For us, uh, in this approach, for a set of languages of interest, what we do, so we get a small vocabulary list of common basic words, typically 100 to 200 items, 100 to 200 words. For each pair of languages, uh, we determine the percentage of words on this list that appear to be cognate. Determination of cognition is dependent on the subjective judgment of the linguist. It's up to the linguist who is uh, analyzing this uh, that uh, he determines what uh, vocabulary items are uh, cognates to each other. So it's completely subjective. And we expect some errors. Of course, in this process, you know, there might be some errors especially if the scholar does not know the language very well. I mean, he is not master of that language 100%. So there is some space for errors. But we hope that the error rate, I mean, it's, it's supposed, it's, it's hypothesized that the error rate will be small enough uh, not to affect the results. So we can then arrange these cognates. I mean, first we determine the cognates, and then we arrange these cognates uh, percentages in a table. So cognate percentages. I mean, this is uh, in the between these two languages, the cognition percentage is this much, like 80 percent, 20 percent, 70 percent, whatever. And from which we draw some conclusion. And from this table, we draw a conclusion. 
about the degree of relationship among the languages involved. For example, we have 10 languages. We, uh, we enlist cognate, uh, cognated uh, uh, vocabulary items of those languages and we find how many, uh, when, what's the percentage of cognition uh, uh, between these uh, languages. And then we draw a conclusion from this result. So here, uh, we have a table. Here is a recent ex example drawn from Central Yambasa Survey Report by Boone et al. discussing languages of Central Province of Cameroon. So here we have lists. Uh, these are the languages you can see on top: Gunu, uh, Elip, uh, Mamala. These are all uh, languages. Now let me read it for you: uh, Yangban, Baka, Mbula, Mbule. Bati, Hijuk, Basa, and that's it. Yeah, that's it. Uh, here, we have here, uh, we, we compare these two languages here. So, Gunu and Ilip. So, we have here 82% uh, of cognates in these, uh, between these two languages. And uh, Mala and Ilip is 90%, and um, Mala and Gunu is 85%. So, in same is the case you can read uh, through. So, here Basa, you see uh, between Basa and Betty is only 41%, so they are far away from each other. And uh, Basa and Hijuk is 88%, and Basa and Gunu, so you can see it's 39%, so that's, that's far, far away from uh, the first Gunu language. And Elip is 38%. Uh, more or less the same uh, here okay from this table uh, we can conclude that uh, you see here uh, ellip uh, yeah ellip uh, mala and yang ben they are closely related speech varieties so mala ellip and yang ben they are closely related you see 88% oh sorry uh, 89% and 90% okay and 82% between uh, uh, these uh, languages okay each other so they are closely uh, related languages uh, varieties and that they are somewhat more distant from gunu baka and imbula so these uh, languages are uh, somewhat uh, f distant from Gono and from Baka and from uh, Embola. It's a little difference, right? And they are even more distant from uh, Bati, <laughs> you see here, it's 69%, and uh, that they are further yet from Hijuk, so you see. Uh, it's uh, Hijuk and uh, Yangban, uh, sorry, Yangban is 42 and Mamala 42 and Elif 41, so they are far away and Basa also the same. If you compare Basa with Yangban, you see uh, there is uh, it's far away. Basa is uh, Basa and Yangbu uh, is 38 and Basa and Mamla 41 and Basa and Elif 38. So this is it. Uh, this is the expression uh, explanation uh, of the table. All right. So there has been a great deal of controversy uh, about whether family trees based on lexostatics are reliable. So there is question on the reliability of uh, lexostatics uh, trees. Uh, uh, those who doubt it point to the possibility that cognate percentages might be strongly affected by vocabulary borrowing. So they say that cognate percentages may be affected by vocabulary borrowing either in a negative or positive direction. So I mean uh, borrowing of uh, vocabulary can uh, take the cognate, uh, cognate percentage uh, farther or it can bring closer. 
uh, to uh, between these two languages with the com the language that are compared for instance Jap Japan Japanese borrowed many words from Chinese without becoming a sino Tibetan language uh, it has recently borrowed many words from English and without becoming an Indo-European language as well so those who favor I mean it m in this way so uh, if you compare Japanese language to its near uh, uh, regional languages, so there will be difference uh, in, in cognate vocabulary between those, uh, between Japanese and other regional languages. Because uh, it's borrowing the words from, uh, from other uh, f farther languages. So those who favor lexostatistics uh, argue that this sort of borrowing is less common in the basic vocabulary word list that they use. So they say in mean, the lack of statistics, um, they say that we do not choose that vocabulary which is borrowed in simple words. So, uh, I mean, they, they reject this objection, this question. So there are uh, two distinct controversies about the use of lack of statistical methods. One issue is whether the family trees uh, produced uh, for languages with fairly high cognate percentage, uh, let's say 60% and higher, or are a reliable indication of the detailed structure of genetic relationships among languages. Everyone accepts that two languages with 85% cognates are certainly related. So um, if uh, the cognate rate is 85% between two languages, so they are certainly related to each other. I mean, this, uh, this much cognate uh, percentage cannot be achieved without their uh, interrelation. So the only question is whether they are necessarily more closely related in a historical sense than uh, either is to language whose cognate percentages with both are, uh, let's say, 80 percent. For example, uh, we might have a situation in which uh, a proto-language A, it splits into B and C. And then C splits into D and E. E then uh, undergoes a period of close contact with a completely unrelated language, Z, Z, and as a result of which it borrows a lot of new vocabulary because E, it gets in relation with a further language, Z, and hence it uh, borrows a lot of new vocabulary from Z. So now, uh, if we lo look back, the relationship between these languages, uh, so E has a lower cognate percentage with D than D has with B. So now E, although E and D are sisters, we are very close sitting together, but E has lower cognate percentage with D. Okay, and uh, then D has uh, one step upper uh, B. I mean, between D and B, there is uh, the percentage of cognates is higher than cognates between D and E because E has connection with Z. So it borrowed a lot of words from uh, that new language. But the historical fact is that. Uh, e is more closely related to D than D is to B. So as per history, uh, D and E are very close. They are sisters. So, I mean, D and E are closer historically, okay, uh, than D and B, but uh, as per the percentage of cognates, so uh, D and E are not so close as B and D are. The second controversy is what to make of relationships involving very low cognate percentages, let's say below 10. So what's the relationship about uh, such languages? 
depending on the nature of uh, the languages and the methods used to determine cognition, these percentages are getting into the range uh, that could arise by chance. So it's, uh, it's uh, argued uh, that it could uh, that could uh, arise by chance or by superficial or indirect recent contact. Swadesh and others uh, took this type of analysis further based on the idea that the average rate of loss of cognates could be regarded as constant over historical time just like the rate of radioactive decay. Swedish uh, looked uh, at some languages where historical stages are well documented and concluded uh, that basic vocabulary decays by 14% every millennium, by 14%. According to the entry on Swedish in the Encyclopedia of Linguistics, it's stated there, this is the quotation from there, that thus if the basic vocabularies of two related languages are found to match by 70%, they can be assumed to have developed from a single language that existed approximately 12 centuries before. So if the cognate cognition ratio is 70% between two languages, so it can be assumed that they developed from one single language, one parent language, and that parent language existed approximately 12 centuries uh, ago. The assumption that basic vocabulary decay is generally uniform has been largely rejected. So vocabulary decay uh, is uh, uniform, so the uniformity of vocabulary decay is rejected. If one allows that language, uh, languages, just like societies, may develop at different rates at different times, the assumption of steady vocabulary decay in particular and the glottochronological method in general is seriously undermined. Everyone recognizes that linguistic decay is not completely uniform. Some people still believe that it is sometimes uniform enough for glottochronological uh, methods to be u a useful approximate guide to linguistic history. <coughs> 